Hello everybody, I'm Keith Brown. Uh, welcome to the second issue of Whatever Etc. This is my video log that I am uh, putting out in conjunction with my regular blog, carlyosper's23.wordpress.com. Uh, I want to thank everyone who gave me feedback on issue one. I hope that uh, I've uh, increase the volume so that you'll be able to hear me a little bit better and I am definitely trying to remember to look into the camera. Okay, uh, what I wanted to do was to go a little bit more over what it means, uh, this term, why I've chosen anarcho-cynicism as the, uh, uh, the name for the kind of philosophizing as a way of life that I want to recommend. Uh, first I want to start with cynicism because that's a word that's still used nowadays. But cynicism with a little c is uh, the person who, you know, always has the worst opinion of how people act, is basically a kind of misanthropist, uh, doesn't believe that anybody does anything except out of some kind of a personal desire to, uh, to get it over on the next guy, and believes that everything is corrupt. Uh, while some of these strains can be stretched back to the ancient cynics who had good philosophical reasons for thinking this the cynic nowadays is basically uh, with a little c the cynic nowadays is is basically the person who uh, who who gives you the worst opinion possible about the motivations of why something might happen and when you say that they're being cynical will always retort no I'm being realistic uh, you're being naive uh, so this is not the kind of cynicism I'm talking about. The cynicism that I'm talking about for anarcho-cynicism is the ancient cynicism, the one passed down from Antisthenes to Diogenes to Kratos and Hipparchia, that then becomes the basis for Stoicism and becomes an inspiration to a number of people, not the least of which is uh, figures like St. Paul, uh, who uh, it is said may have even studied at a cynical Stoical school, uh, and, uh, and certainly... Uh, these figures draw their own uh, draw their own inspirations from people like Socrates. So the cynics of old were people who defaced the currency, and by the meaning of that, of course, is that they they would contest and struggle with the nomos or nomoi, the custom or customs of a city or of the day. Uh, so this notion of defacing the currency is how we how we talk about going in and taking what is currently seen as somehow the way things have always been or as the best way of doing things and then asking a lot of penetrating questions and asking a lot of difficult questions about why does everybody think this is the way things should be? Why couldn't it be another way? The cynic admits that it's natural for human beings, <clears throat> natural and necessary for human beings to want to uh, have customs. But, sorry folks, there's no custom that is ever brought out of the necessity of having customs in order to live in society, there's no custom that comes out of that that itself has any necessity. So that human beings need to develop customs in order to live together in societies, yeah, well, I admit that. But that human beings have developed a custom that is so unassailable in and of itself that it has to always be that way? No, the cynic won't admit that. In fact, the cynic wants to say only nature, only nature in its abiding, obtaining, natural patterns has that which will always be the way that it is. The undergirding of nature. So the cynic is going to be someone who wants to look also at not only the experience of the natural world that you have personally, but also be paying attention to what sciences uh, are coming out with and understanding how the natural philosopher, or as we've referred to the natural philosopher for the last 160 years, the scientist, uh, how the natural philosopher or scientist is, you know, getting some new information about nature. 
So we want to be able to turn to nature as our last arbiter and not human tradition. Uh, anarche or anarchy uh, comes from a Greek word that means basically an, that's the, that's the alpha privative uh, there, the on means no, and arche means the origin or the first principle, the oldest, the original, right? So it would be no origin or no first principle. The interesting issue here is, is that everybody who looks for an arche, that is, everybody who seeks the arche, often uh, so defines what the RK is that it will sooner or later with greater contest you'll see that it's not the RK because it's obviously not the first. It's not the RK because it's obviously not the origin. So what we're looking at here then with an RK is an actual recognition of a necessary skeptical attitude that all human beings should try to maintain. And that skeptical attitude is that if someone tells you what the first principle is, you should already be ready to ask them, why is that the first principle? And demonstrate to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the first and that there is nothing beyond it. Even Aristotle in his Metaphysics actually says that he is not telling you that the first cause is exactly what he is describing in the physics and the metaphysics. He is saying that for the sake of argument, we have to have somewhere where we stop. And then, in other words, we stop as a, at a starting place that we can then go back and build a model that makes sense of the world that we live in it very well may be that you'll discover after the usage of that model for a while that there's something beyond that. So you actually can kind of see in the dialectical progression of philosophy, natural and social philosophy, what we call the now today, natural philosophy is the natural sciences, social philosophy is the social sciences or the human sciences, that that what we had originally thought was the obtaining origin, and there's something before it, right? So really, we follow Max Weber as anarcho-cynics. We follow the sociologist Max Weber in saying, we'll come up with some ideal types, but we'll always be willing to keep contesting these types and see if they need more tweaking, and maybe if they actually are a supplementary principle rather than a first principle. So the notion then of the anarcho-cynic is the cynic who is always contesting the current trust, uh, traditions and customs of the day and attitudes and assumptions. And the anarchist in the philosophical sense, not of a violent chaos uh, wielder, but the anarchist who, who, who humbly understands that all first principles that are put forward are put forward only for the sake of trying to clarify what we see going on around us and that they're always open to reinterpretation because we never actually have the origin. We never actually have the first principle. Whether you want to call it God or cosmos or nature or the first or the good or the encompassing, whatever it is, if you get too exact of a definition of it, you've already started losing the game. So anarcho-cynic, the one who contests the traditions of the day, including traditions of the arcade of the first origin, and who humbly with Socrates admits, I know that I don't know nearly as much as I think I do. Uh, a really good example that I would like to leave you with today is a cute little story that some people might find to be a little superficial. But I think it kind of goes to the heart of how quickly we will not only adopt a custom uh, from our daily lives that then appears to be the way things should be done uh, without thinking. Uh, but uh, how much 
our habits uh, kind of predetermine this, the amount of things that we're willing to ask about, right? So the cynic, uh, the anarcho cynic is a disruptor. The anarcho cynic is someone who disrupts the usual flow of the current, right? So that the so that defacing the currency is not about what's current here now, not about what's happening right now currently. Defacing the currency is about is about muddying the water, about disturbing the flow of a current that everybody's floating on that might not be taking us where we think it's taking us. So here's the story. It involves uh, four generations of women in a single family. One day, they're uh, having a Thanksgiving dinner, and the youngest daughter in the family, the youngest woman in the family, who's actually 11 years old, she asks her great-grandmother, well, actually, she asks her mom this. The custom in the family is to cut the turkey in half and then bake each half separately in a pan. The little girl asks her mom, why do we cut the turkey in half? What's the benefit of it? The mother says, I suppose it's because it helps to retain a certain kind of flavor and allows us to do this or that. Mom, she turns to the little girl's grandmother, and she says, Mom, why is it that we cut the turkey in half and then we bake it in two separate pans? And then the mother says, well, that's just the way that your grandmother, the great-grandmother, it's just the way that your grandmother had always taught us to do it. Mom, now the grandmother, turns to the great-grandmother and says, Mom, why is it the case, the little great-granddaughter wants to know, why is it the case that we in our family for generations have cut the turkey in half, put it in two separate pans, and baked it? And the great-grandmother says, Oh, honey, don't you realize that that's because when your father and I were first married and you were a little girl, we lived in an apartment above a grocery store. And we had this little bitty oven that barely could hold one half of a turkey in a pan. So your father, who always got a turkey for uh, part of his bonus, uh, Thanksgiving bonus, would cut the turkey in half and then I would bake it in two separate pans throughout the course of the day or the night before we would have Thanksgiving dinner. And this was all quite funny to the little great-granddaughter who was at the moment that the great-grandmother was explaining all this the little great-granddaughter was helping her mother put one half of the turkey in a pan in one of the ovens that they owned an oven that would actually have been big enough for like a 30 pound turkey no problem and then putting in the second pan into a second oven because by the third generation of this family they had actually achieved to a point where um, they had two ovens in the kitchen and both ovens were big enough for a 30 pound turkey this to me is a wonderful example of how human beings adopt a custom as their own and then think this is the way things are supposed to be done but it's all based, not only is it all based on not really thinking and asking why, it's also based on accepting that somehow the habit, somehow the custom contains within it the wisdom of the origin. But when you actually chase it back to the origin, you find that it's from a completely contingent circumstance that had nothing to do with any necessity other than the fact that the family originally was poor and had to adapt this method in order to be able to cook a whole turkey for Thanksgiving. Okay, well, I'm going to let you go. I'll leave you with my testimony for yesterday. We must leap into the ecstasy of life or remain prisoners of a stasis caught betwixt and between busy existence and sleepy fantasy. My friends, shall we excel or shall we subsist? Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you next time. And I welcome all comments.